Hello, Harry here. As with all the Jog On podcast guest episodes, this is available in both audio and video to listen to on all podcast platforms and to watch on our YouTube channel, Jog On Podcast with Harry Morgan. For all Jog On videos, podcast episodes and merchandise, head to thisisjogon.com. Whether you are watching or listening, hello and thank you for joining us. I'll cut to the chase. The man you are about to hear from is fast. I can list a few of his road times to give you a flavour. A 62.11 half marathon, a 28.06 10k and a 13.36 5k. All of those times coming in the year in which this was recorded, 2021. Jack Rowe is a runner like few others. I hate losing, like in yeah. any form, any game, to anyone. At 25 years old, he stands at just over six foot three inches and demonstrates a passion, a commitment, concrete mindset, and a rare gift for running. Returning from his training in America, he has shown particularly remarkable form in the last 18 months. I was recently invited to Jack's flat in London, where we set up the cameras and the microphones. To my surprise, I was offered biscuit-flavoured tea, which I can tell you tasted incredible. Our conversation was sat in on by a few inquisitive occupants of the flat, including Dan Jarvis, another superb runner and training partner of Jack's. So if you can picture it, we had a very small live studio audience for this one. Jack and I discussed his early struggles getting into running. And the first five, six races I did, all I said for the 10, 15 minutes before was, as soon as this race is over, I'm telling my dad I'm quitting. I, I can't do this. Like yeah. I just felt sick. And I was like, I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna quit, I hate this, I hate this. And then the gun went and it all went. That slowly but surely developed into a love for it. Mid-August, I went, I just want to get better at running. He had many fascinating stories. It was the first time I'd ever beaten him. And he came up to me, he shook my hand. He was like, incredible. Mm. And the next Monday morning after that race, he got up at 7 a.m. and he started running. And I personally really enjoyed having the opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one with him about his life so far. I hope that you get something from this episode. And if you want to help us out in some small way or know someone mentioned in this episode, please do share it. So please, welcome to Jog On, Jack Rowe. So I think, Jack, uh, the first thing I want to ask you about is your background. You've begun in football like so many. I spoke to someone a little while back, a guy called Graham Rush, who's a fantastic 5K runner, and he had a bit of a transition from football into running. Can you just talk me through, like, when you were playing football and running, it sounds like you had a few injuries. It got a little bit kind of tricky on the hamstrings and stuff. What, what was that moment like when you thought, I, I want to go full time with the running? Was it a difficult decision? It was, it was, because I really enjoyed the team aspect of playing, you know, with friends, you know, on a Sunday morning. But when you're racing on a Saturday morning, yeah. 6K, hard cross country, and then you try and recover. And then Sunday morning, you got to go out and play 90 minutes. And, you know, I was the captain of the team and I was always in trouble because training for the week was Saturday morning. So I was missing training as it was anyway, having to turn up Sunday. And I went from being one of the smallest kids in the year to like the biggest in like six months. Like I grew about six inches and mm. like my body just couldn't, couldn't keep up at all and I remember not making the Surrey team like one uh, January because I'd been injured because I played football I remember sitting there like watching all of these people that I knew I could compete with competing at the inter-counties that year and that, yeah. that was when it really struck home it was evident I was never going to make it you know to the Premier League and play the top level of the with football but there was a chance I could make it with the running and it was kind of that, that was my switch point of like, if I want to be good, I can't do both. Um, and it was tough. It was tough. I continued to play for the school team a little bit longer because they were, those, those games were like midweek and I could kind of vaguely get away with it. But yeah, it was, it was tough, like moving away from that kind of team aspect with your friends. I've been doing it since I was 11, 12 years old. Yeah, of course. I remember like we, the team would be gutted if like a, a game ever got called off of being like, waterlogged pitch or like when it snowed like everyone was in like yeah so no it was big it was big I do, do miss my football and was it a solo decision or were parents encouraging it? were coaches encouraging it was it you that made that decision my parents had tried to encourage it for a long time because I think they could see that I did have a future in the running um, so they kind of like leaned but from a distance you mm. know there was a few a few races where I didn't do as well and they were saying you know if you could commit more time to your running do you not think you could have been slightly further up because they just saw my frustration at not doing as well as I wanted to do like I hate losing like in yeah. any form any game to anyone and so you know the first few national champs I came to you know I was outside the top 100 and like I steadily cut down those places but I kind of got stuck in that kind of 30 to 50 range where I would do all this training still play football and not get any better mm. and I think my parents at one point were like, you know, 
you could be quite good at running. And it, that's almost like that. That's how to really get me going is to be like, well, you could be quite good at something or like, I bet you couldn't get better. Yeah, and, yeah. and then it's almost that like, I have to prove you There's wrong. There's a challenge there. Yeah. And do you feel like once you made that change, once the football dropped, did you start to see a quick progression with the running? Did everything start to improve with the running? It did. Yeah. There was a huge progression very quickly, mainly because I could actually do my long run on a Sunday and, you know, yeah. and that and it wasn't just a 90 minute game with the, with the guys. But no, there was, there was quite, and I got over my injuries because you just assume that fitness is fitness, but you know, going for a you know, 60, 70 minute run at that time on a Sunday mm. is completely different fitness to playing football and the lunging and the changing of direction and you know, getting to stop every 45 seconds because of a goal kick or a throw in. So no, there was, I, I got to create a program with my coach at that time and we sat down and he was very happy that I gave up the football um, mm. and we could just create something slightly more structured. And there was a bit more of a process rather than it just being like haphazard, you know, has he, has someone broken his leg on a Sunday, you know, in the rivalry against, you know, Molesy Town, so. Yeah. Do you miss the football at all? If, if running just didn't exist tomorrow, do you think you would creep back there? Would that be the second sport, the second passion for you? 100%, 100%. When I was uh, in my sixth form, I very sneakily played for a five-a-side team on a Wednesday night. <laughs> right, um, yeah. So it, kind of coming up to our last year in school, the guys created a team. And I kind of was like, yeah, I'll come down every other Wednesday um, and I'd play 15 to 20 minutes. But it wound me up because I wasn't as good as I used to be. You know, when I was growing up, you know, I was one of the better guys on the pitch. And, you know, my P teacher at school was a Fulham scout. And mm. so he told me that if I ever wanted to go pro, I had to join Molsey team, which were our rival. Um, and I had to go and play every position for a season. And he knew the coach and the coach was going to put me in there. And I was good, you know. I, I never had to worry about, you know, my kind of position on the team. And I was very confident on the ball. And then, but I went back, you know, four or five years later and I had two left feet and had no touch. And, Interesting, you know, yeah. And I was a skinny guy. You know, you're playing all these men in a men's league on a Wednesday and you just you got blasted if, you know, any of them caught up with you. Yeah. So, but no, I 100% go back and play and I think if if and when I do stop running I'd love to play for like a Sunday league team with with friends and stuff because I just love the social aspect of it yeah absolutely one of the interesting things about you Jack is that when I talk to people on this podcast is often you hear stories and almost it's not quite as interesting is that like myself uh, like Louise who I spoke to even uh, Graham Rush a little bit there was this kind of passion from running very very early on like for whatever reason whether we saw for me it was watching my dad in the London Marathon and it was just kind of it was always there within me I just and I was also rubbish at things like football so it was quite <laughs> clear I didn't I had a direction to go and that was the one thing I could do was run. Um, but for you, it sounds more like maybe it was a slightly slower start to fall in love with running. Like yeah. you referenced uh, in an interview, I heard you talk about the fact that you looked at people running laps and thought, well, why would I do that? I just want to like go and kick a ball. Cause like what's, it takes a while to realize the point. Like, why are we just running? Nothing else, just run. So yeah. when does that happen? Do you have success first and then you start to go, oh yeah, I'm good. I like it. Or did, what, was there a kind of a falling in love as you got a little bit older and a little bit better? Definitely. So I got tricked into my first ever cross country race and, um, in my first you know, cross-country trial, the coach knew that I wasn't going to run the team. And so I finished just outside the qualifying places. <laughs> and then the next year, she said that the top qualifying was top five, you know, and, and I came sixth. And then she took six to the race. And then I turned up on race day and found myself up near the front, you know, halfway through. And I was like, that's when my competitive edge kicked in. Yeah. And that was like, well, if I'm here, I'm not going to lose. And I think that kind of like rolled on for a few years where I was then kind of known as the cross country guy, you know, right. the guy that just turned up and, and, and could do it. Um, but I still didn't love it because I still loved the football. And then I think it was when you started to get a little bit better and everything was a little bit smoother, you then just enjoyed, you know, cause I actually got asked recently, like, why do you love running? And like, it's a good question. I love running now because it just clears my mind, you know, and I can go out and I could be in the worst mood, like seething about something or this or whatever. Yeah. And I go for a run and five minutes in, I'm just like back to zero. But I also do love the fact that, you know, I can just go out for 18 miles now and have a chat the whole time. And it's not hard. And I'm, you know, I'm not breathing and my legs feel good and you can just go and go and go. So there definitely is a, a side to it where like, I love running because I am really well, quite good at it now. And mm. like, I enjoy that kind of ease at which I can do it. Mm. But yeah, it took a while. I think that's a big thing for some people is when they find that ease, whatever level they get to, it's when they get fit within their potential. Mm. And there's a thing, I remember my dad once describing that when he was right in his prime, he was injury free and he was right on the verge of, of he'd sort of done all his marathon training. Mm. And he talked about when he'd go and catch the train or the tube stuff, he would sort of just lightly jog, even in just jeans stuff, because mm. it got to a point where it was almost easier to just jog because everything just flowed so well. Mm -hmm. And I think for some people, although there's that mass of people out there who look 
look at running and go, what are you doing? Like, yeah. why do you put yourself through that? They don't sort of stick at it long enough to ever get to that point where it just clicks. And one day, like you say, you can go for 10, 12, 15 miles or more. Mm-hmm. And it just, it's easy. Like it's mm-hmm. just, it's comfortable and you can talk to a friend. And, and for a lot of people, I think it takes a long time to ever get there and get their body to that state. So it's interesting you talk about the fact that it just got to that point where it became comfortable and, yeah. and the love kind of comes with that. Came there, yeah, that kind of like, peacefulness like once you could actually get to that point was really nice no definitely i couldn't, I couldn't agree more with what you just said one of the things about your career jack following it so far up to the age of you're now 25 is that you have been quite slow and steady in terms of the progression it's been you can kind of track it you know year on year obviously like any career ebbs mm-hmm. and flows there's ups there's downs but you have had particularly recently had a lot of success but it's, it's sort of taken time and quite often we see you know 18 19 year olds who have already hit the olympics and stuff and you do sometimes as as wonderful as it all seems you do mm-hmm wonder like it's difficult when you're you're hitting that ceiling it's like well where'd you go next you're just trying you're just trying to maintain being at the top yeah so i wonder if you first of all agree that it's been a bit more steady progress and and has that been intentional has there been um has there been good coaches around you who've held you back a bit to allow you to progress a little more slowly no definitely like i definitely wasn't the most talented as a kid um and i was definitely very injured as a kid Mm -hmm. you know going through all those those hamstring and hip problems and so I was always kind of behind and I was always having to like kind of claw that time back. I made a nice jump initially when I went to the university, uh, St. Mary's University. Great coaches, a lot of support, a good environment, lots of people to run with. That then tailed off a little bit as I started to question whether I just wanted to be a university student, you know, mm. for, for 18 months. And that In terms tough. of like the social life? Just and, the social life. Right, yeah, okay, and yeah, I yeah. wanted to go out two or three times a week and I, course, and, you yeah. know, and I, yeah, yeah. you know, and that, that hampers the long run and the two sessions a week. And for a while you get away with it. You know, I heard the best kind of like story about it ever was, you know, you start forgetting to do all these things. You don't take your iron tablets, you eat the pizza in the canteen, mm. you know, you don't do your strength work. You don't go to bed at 10 PM when you're running well, you go to bed at midnight. It's almost like a plane wing and like one bolt falls off and like the wing's still on and like two bolts fall off and the wing's still on and 10 bolts and the wing's still on. And then on the 11th, everything falls off you realize, and, and, yeah. and that's that really hit me in my third year at St. Mary's where I'd kind of been getting away with it getting away with it because I was trained by Mick Woods at the time and you know he builds a huge aerobic engine underneath yeah. you and so that managed to carry you for so long and then all of a sudden you fall off a cliff and <laughs> and everyone beats you do you know yeah. what I mean and there was that real moment of questioning where I'm like, do I actually want to do this? You start giving yourself excuses, like you're getting nailed by everyone in sessions and everyone in races. And you're like, well, of course he's going to beat me. Like he's running 50 miles you know, a week more than me and I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that. And you almost make excuses and make it okay for yourself. I then got the perfect get out of jail free card to go to the States um, for three years and just had that discipline kind of like driven into me um, was that the changing moment did you, did you feel like if, if america hadn't happened there would have been some difficulties in terms of like did america give you a whole new focus when you 100 percent, 100 percent. like i told my dad before going to america that i had three years otherwise i'd buy a suit get a proper job and get on the train to waterloo look um, on linkedin and yeah, yeah yeah exactly and start looking on linkedin for for roles here there and everywhere mm. but i went out there and they just kind of built a foundation that I'm definitely still leaning on now. You know, we were doing core seven days a week, mm. three gym sessions a week, you know, and a level of consistency that I hadn't ever seen. You know, I, I went out there and put three 17 mile weeks back to back and I thought I was about to win the NCAAs. Um, mm. How very wrong I was, but like that level of consistency I hadn't seen for two two years or so. And that really put me in a good place. Um, COVID obviously ended that a little bit prematurely, which was a shame because I had a really good track coach in, in Andy Powell during my last year at the yep. University of Washington. And then COVID hit and I came home and we then sat down with Tim Eglin, my current coach. And he said, you know, there's going to be two ways through COVID. There's going to be the people that sit around and don't run because there's nothing to train for. And then there's going to be the people that put the biggest block of their life in and mm. come out of COVID fitter and faster than they've ever been. And so that's what we did. So we went in up to my training by 10, 15, 20 miles a week managed to build a level of consistency just without, you know, it was quite weird going from the full support package of the States with physio three times a week, you know, massage therapist four times a week, all the recovery tools under the sun to all of a sudden not being able to see a physio for, for nine months. You know, it was just kind of like, can you hold your body together? We popped out at the end of COVID and I've just been reaping the rewards of that really. So yeah, no, it has been slow and steady. I wouldn't have had it any other way. I look at a lot of the people that 
were A, putting minutes into me as a 17, 18 year old and 50% aren't running anymore. And, yeah, the, other, and, and the other 50% aren't beating because they were more naturally talented than me. It was an unfair fight at 17, 18 years old because they were literally just better. I think that ability to have to like train and teach yourself how to win and teach yourself how to, you know, run hard is huge because when they start losing, they give up because they've never had, mm. they've never had to like fight for it a little right. bit. Yeah, there's a strange dichotomy there. I've come across it before. I've, I've noticed that, that, that sometimes it's almost not beneficial. It kind of comes back to the whole thing of having success too early mm. is when you are very, very gifted. Yeah. Um, I've had conversations on this podcast about this is that it almost doesn't set you up quite as well for when you do hit your mid twenties, when it really mm. comes in that like, okay, everyone here is certainly talented, but now it's who's put the work in as well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they haven't learned to put the work in as much because they didn't need to, because they yeah. were just that good. Whereas it sounds like you had, had the ability to a point but then it's like well what do I need to do now to get myself up to that talent level as well mm. and that's laid this fantastic foundation of you know how to work hard topped yeah. up by America it sounds yeah, like definitely I've got one of my best friends Scott House that I have the best story about him and he won't mind me saying this <laughs> he used to put minutes into me as a kid like you know mm. he won he won everything he was he worked incredibly hard he had a great coach uh, at Bracknell and he won everything. You know, he won the international schools on the track, the international schools in the cross country. And I remember the first time I beat him, it took 18 months of work at, at St. Mary's and we went to the national cross country relays at Mansfield and mm. I beat him on about 10, 11 seconds and over 3K. Yeah. And it was the first time I'd ever beaten him. And he came up to me, he shook my hand, he was like, incredible mm. and the next monday morning after that race he got up at 7 a.m and he started running and he was like he was like i'm not i'm not getting beaten by jack again do you mm. know what i mean and it, it was like you know i had to chase and chase and chase and chase and chase that's been the story of lots of people yeah, so. yeah. and how, so great to hear that like you then inspired him to get up the next morning because yeah. it does you get that kind of like bounce back a bit of an echo chamber and all of a sudden people kind of accelerate each other exactly which sounds like it was the environment in america i, I want to bring you back to um saint mary's and and america for people that don't know saint mary's was university where you were for three years and then you did a master's out in America mm -hmm. but it was interesting because there was an opportunity for you to go to America even sooner than that yeah. and you made a bit of a decision sort of last minute to kind of go actually put the brakes on here I don't know that I'm quite ready can you just talk me through that process what that was like what made you make the decision that oh, I'm going to stick in the UK for a little bit longer until I'm a little bit older before maybe then going to America yeah so out the back of my A levels I went to all of these you know talks uh, that kind of surrounding schools put on with how to get out to America and you know use these scholarship routes and what to expect and what you need to do. Um, and I had good contact with Florida State University. So a, a huge Nike Nike uh, University. And in the end, I just, I kind of sat down, like I almost felt like I wasn't ready. Um, part of me thinks I took, I've always seemed to slide towards taking the easy option. And like, maybe that was too much of a flash in the pan for me and a, too much of a big call. Mm. Um, Cause I ended up going out to America, but I also went out with two of my best friends, you know? And so it's almost yes. an interesting call. Would I have gone to San Francisco if the same offer wasn't given to Scott Halstead and Jacob Allen? That's a great question. And having Brits out there, who knows? What anyway, do you think? Do you think, do you think? I think I would have. I think I would have. Because I'd, you still would have, it just would have been a bit more of like a... Yeah, but it wouldn't have been that automatic. Yeah. Yes, let's do it. You know, all three of us on the same plane out there. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, so in the end, I decided to go to Birmingham uh, University and my dad was very happy with that. And I had an unconditional to do economics and, and yeah. geography. And he was all, all for it. And mid-August, I went, I just want to get better at running. I'm never going to use that degree. I don't, you know, I have no interest in going down those routes. I just want to get, get better. And I think St. Mary's is the right place for me. Yeah, it's the maybe, platform from which you can spring. Maybe subconsciously that's me taking the easy option because I lived 10 miles down the road and I knew people that were going there yeah, and I knew people yeah. already there. But running was, the, running was at the heart of that choice. Running though. was the heart of the choice, I hope. So my dad was very, very upset with me. Um, yeah, you mentioned this before. You said like he didn't talk he to didn't you for a few weeks. He like two weeks. Yeah. So why, why was that? Because of the degree thing or, the, or he felt that you were taking an easy route? Or He's a big believer in keeping doors open and keeping okay. options open to give myself as many options as possible. And he saw going to St. Mary's as being Eggs all in one basket. Eggs kind of all thing. in one basket, mm. and because the, you, you do get a degree, um, it is more useful than some people tell you. Um, but a lot of people don't go down the sports science route, and I think athletes at St Mary should be pushed to do degrees that they're actually passionate about, yeah. rather than just fall into that like, oh, you're an athlete at St Mary's, you should do sports science because there's definitely a culture of that. There I is, yeah. and I and I definitely fell into that, and I wish I'd you know had changed that. So yeah, okay. but he yeah he wasn't wasn't best pleased at all. 
so I went and spoke to Mick, you know, because Mick was the coach, uh, my coach at the yeah, time. Yeah, of course, he's got the link. And he's so, also yeah. the St. Mary's coach. And, yeah. so, uh, and so I went up to him and said, you know, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about not going to Birmingham. And he was obviously reasonably happy with that. Birmingham are their rival team. Um, <laughs> and he said, well, you know, where are you thinking of going? And you could see he was a bit worried for a while, like you're not going to Loughborough or something like that, are you? Mm. And uh, he, I was like, no, I want to come to St. Mary's. And he, he almost fell off his chair. And I was like, but I'm, I think it's a bit too late. Like, is there any chance I can get in? And he was like, you can have whatever course you want. You can have whatever room in Clive you want. He was like, he was like, I can sort it today. The um, perks of fast running. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, exactly. Amazing. And so, you know, and, but, you know, you look back and you're like, you know, how different could my life have been if I'd gone that Birmingham oh, route? You know, yeah. it could it'd have been crazily different. So it's so easy to look back on those moments because when there's very clear forks in the road, with yeah. that being one, that you, yeah. you always wonder what if I'd gone left rather than right, for example. Exactly. You know, like St. Mary's was my way into San Francisco, which was my way into Seattle mm. for my third, uh, second masters. And so, yeah, but no, it was a, it was a cool fork in the road. Mm. Obviously feel now like I made, made the right call. I yeah, definitely yeah. questioned that in my third year when, you know, I was, yeah. Things weren't going so well. Things weren't going as well. And I almost split my year. I, I walked over to the, the Dean's office to try and split my third year. Cause I was like, I just need to get my running back on track. And I rang my dad as I was walking over the field. I was like, dad, I'm thinking about splitting my third year. And he was like, turn the bleep around. <laughs> Get to the library, finish this degree. He's like, you're not spending one more day in that place that you have to. Um, he sounds like a taskmaster. You know, he, he's, he's, he's brilliant. Like, he's brilliant. He's my you know, biggest fan, biggest mate. Um, and he supports me to the world's end. And it was the right call because if I had split my year, I wouldn't have had that chance to go to San Francisco with Scott and Jacob. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd have missed the boat. So yeah, absolutely huge that I did it. But no, he's uh, it was a very very short call that one. Yeah, yeah. So, but it, it ended well. Ah, oh, superb. So then, in terms of your you're on the plane, you're flying out to San Francisco yeah. with a couple of friends, which is which is excellent. Makes mm -hmm. the whole transition that little bit smoother. I know it's it's a huge period of your life, and it's very hard to just summarize on a, a UK pod based podcast. Uh, but roughly, in terms of America overall, was it a positive experience? What was the Jack that flew back like compared to the one that went out there? You talked about the fact that more discipline understanding and also just getting a bit more of a sense of like oh wow there is another level out here of running mm. just what what was that like was it a, was it a life-changing experience america oh it was huge huge like complete life experience you know to drop yourself into you know a different culture different town you know everything was different like the way you qualified for things the way you paid for things like you know mm. and it was it was cool it was interesting to see how their kind of like university life was their route into the professional life was met a lot of cool people got very lucky like it just have to appreciate how lucky you, you know you get i got on very very well with all six of my coaches because i actually had three coaching changes which is critical as well people don't understand probably listening to this when you when you have a dedicated coach well who are more club based just how important that relationship is like it's yeah. it's massive and so I, I went out there and i committed to he helen Lehman winters um and her assistant benji wetley they produced really good Brits. You know, Charlotte Taylor made the world championships in 2017. They had uh, Alex Short running really fast over 10K. So I was excited to join that program, you know, and we had 12 fantastic months with her. And then we were actually, we came back to London for that summer and we were actually all the SF guys were on a night okay. out in Clapham. Mm. And so it was like Ryan Driscoll, me, Ben Alcock, Scott, Jacob, Alex Howard. There was actually an Australian was visiting London at the time. And Helen called on, on my phone. I was like, well, this is kind of cool timing. At least you could speak to everyone at once, you know? And so we were, we were on Clapham High Street and I was like, Helen, what's up? And she was like, Jack, I got some really bad news. And I was like, a bit worried. I was like, what's, what's happened? And she was like, I'm taking the job at the University of Oregon. Uh, and yeah. I was like, my heart sunk a little bit. And I was like, oh, but what an opportunity. You know, Oregon is, you know, the number one running spot, They're running good. university yep. you know, in America, in the world. Because at that point, you've, you've built a sort of a year relationship with Helen. Everything's going well. So exactly. it must have been that part of your thought, this is where it all goes downhill. I'm going to get matched up with someone I don't get on with or whatever. And exactly. You must know, have been and, some doubts. And it worked. You know, I, you know, you built that relationship. You understand. I understand how she works. She understood how, how I worked. And, you know, and that takes time. Um, and I'd had a mm. huge season. You know, I broke 14 minutes for the first time. I've gone very close to going under 29 minutes for 10K. Yep. Had some good cross-country performances. Broke eight minutes for the first time over 3K. You know, so perfect and you know and then all of a sudden that's just like thrown up in the air anyway i had to was kind of involved in the coach finding process because i was seen as one of the senior athletes on the team oh, awesome um, that's nice they gave you that Are you yeah uh, it was very cool in that? there was two or three coaches in the uh 
in the mix for it. And then I found out that the assistant coach was staying and one of the coaches that was in the mix was his best man at his wedding. So I, 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 I see it was yeah. going to be one of them. Um, yeah. But it, they were cool, but it was a completely different training setup, completely different method. Helen was all about intensity, not a massive volume, but really good quality sessions, you know, eight by K hard. Okay. And he was just tempo, huge amount of tempo, huge amount of strength. Um, and I got really, really fit, but like my fitness was very different. You know, in, mm. in first year of Helen, I kind of had not much fitness, but I was really sharp. Mm. And then with Tim, it was like, I was really fit, but not like, that sharp. Almost like a Mick Woods aerobic base approach at yes. all? Yes, yeah, but yeah. yeah, so honestly very close to that. So, you know, lots of tempo work, lots of broken reps, um, long track reps and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then after did did well, not quite what I wanted to do, but you know made the national cross as an individual, which is big. And then in my third year, I got the call up to go to University of Washington. So you know, huge Pac-12 school, huge sports school. The coach has had huge success. He'd actually he actually left Oregon. So he was the one that dragged Helen to Oregon. So okay. as a big kind of like coaching domino switch, and he was kind of perfectly in between, where he was like high volume, lots of easy training, but then a huge amount of like race specific work. You know, so you so. always got to sample the trifecta, the whole exactly. three. So you actually, yeah. that's, that's giving you quite a nice balance and psychologically giving you a, a exactly. you understand those different approaches now. And so now I pick and I can pick and choose with Tim, you know. I, exactly. I was about to say with Tim, now you can get an idea of, well, this worked here, this worked here, yeah. this worked here. And we try and meet in the middle. Got you. Um, and so, no, back to your original question. Sorry, I've side waffled there. <laughs> that's fine. No, I, I learned a lot about how good you had to be. You know, you look at these guys, you know, were still way ahead of me when I was finishing my States and mm. States career and they were how hard they worked the mileage they ran and it was just an understanding you turn up to an NCA cross and I came 80th two years in a row wow. and I'm like like what are these guys doing and mm. then you look at their training and they're running 20 miles every Sunday you know they're running 110 miles a week they're doing this they're doing that and I was like it was actually quite good to see because I knew I wasn't doing that you know, if I was running all of those then things be more and still not competing. But you could uh, see where the gaps were. Exactly. Yeah. And then I just had to come home and plug them. Yeah, yeah, of um, course. It would be interesting because I'm looking to go out to Flagstaff in March. And oh, I excellent. imagine I'll face up against a few of these people yeah, that of course. two or three years ago were killing me in the States. And so it'd be quite interesting to see if I have See where you're up. at now, yeah. Because you always look at these races and you're like, oh, well, I should be about there. But mm. you don't know until you go there and race them on their own turf. You can never tell, yeah, yeah. How it's going to end up. Do you think that overall in America, I mean, without making vast generalizations, but mm. like like the is there a bit more of a culture of sort of dedication and an attitude to um, the discipline within it? It certainly seems like you're provided with a lot. Like you must have felt quite lucky at points of being like, whoa, I'm just got this physio here and like the, the all the equipment's amazing and like is everything kind of scaled up a few times? Yeah, it's it's nuts. Like the amount of money they have is just ridiculous. It is a little bit you kind of almost have to buy it in, and that's how they kind of like suck you in. It's like, look, we're providing 110% of what you need. Hmm. So if you're not willing to give us at least a hundred percent then like there's 50 people queuing to have your spot and that's how they tie you in but no it is it is crazy you know the the football stadium the university of washington had is bigger than wembley and it's full <laughs> and it's full every time you know yeah. you go to the go to the games and it's just crazy you know the whole town floods into the stadium and so no there's level of support they're willing to give is huge but they do expect a lot and that was perfect for me. And I think it's perfect for internationals in that kind of senior year when you're doing a masters because you just get to piggyback on the back of their system, take all the pros, and then you get to leave and go back to the UK. And then hopefully you've kind of shuffled your way up the pecking order a yeah, little yeah, bit. Yeah. The people I feel sorry for are the people in the States who then have to go back and they then have to compete against the same people. Do you know what I mean? Whereas like the Australians come in, yep. the Canadians come in, the Brits come in and they kind of like piggyback off this system and then they fly back to their respective like countries and, you know, have just shuffled themselves up the pecking order. Whereas, you know, these guys in the States, if they don't get a pro contract when they graduate, like they quit, you know. It's mad, isn't it? You know, so you have all of this talent, all of this level of athlete and, you know, there's just no funding. There's no club system. You yeah. know, it's just like we've got, we fall back on Aldershot and Bedford and, and you know, it's nuts. And you, and the other thing is you have to pay your coaches like, you know, thousands of pounds a month. Yeah, yeah. You know, whereas that's another, you know, huge like rabbit hole we can go down about yeah. paying coaches over here and, you know, so, whether it should be done. It's just a different world out there. Yeah. I love that San Francisco had a couple of videos of you up on YouTube where they almost did like an, almost like an athlete spotlight type mm. thing. And they had like shots of you sort of walking through 
through the campus with your backpack. It <laughs> yeah. felt quite kind of like university. I quite enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. But even just seeing that video and being like the fact that they'll even like take some time out with an athlete, talk about his experiences. Yes, okay, it's promotion for San Francisco University to make yeah. him look great, which they are. Even those moments we were like, this is weird. There's a, like a camera crew kind of following me around. Mm-hmm. I'm getting interviewed and stuff. Like you must, it must give you a sense of like, yeah, they, they care about me as an athlete. No, they do. They do. And they, you know, it is a very holistic approach. You know, they, they will throw absolutely everything at you. And it was very cool. One of the local teams sent me a video because it was being played on the local TV uh, channel. And so he, he was like, he was like, as if I'm looking at Jack Rowe on like, I don't know, the local Californian yeah, yeah. channel. They do prop you up and they're like, we're the best university. Yeah, of course. That's going to be the part best of university yeah, in yeah, the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. No, it, it, it was cool. It, I got a lot of stick from my from my classmates with the camera crew kind of yeah, like yeah. rolling in behind. And no, it's nice. It's he cool. was like, he was like, make sure you put your hand up. Like you have to ask a question if you're on TV yeah, and, yeah. and stuff like that. But no, it was cool. So then you're coming back to the UK, and to say a completely changed person would be a bit strong. But there must be methodologies and things you brought back from America regarding a um, little bit of extra S and C here and there, a little bit of just generally being quite um, focused and disciplined. You had an interesting story about Helen, the coach. The fact that one of the first days you turned up a little bit late and she was quite mm. serious even though it was only a couple of minutes can you just tell that story and, and and has that made you sort of a little more punctual and just generally taken it a bit more seriously definitely like I think you could ask any of my training partners before I left and punctuality definitely wasn't my strong point and it's probably not my strong point now but I'm better <laughs> um, but yeah I turned up at 903 on maybe like day two or three and she like just straight faced came up to me and we said if you're gonna turn up late like go home and like and she was like actually no not go home like we'll pay for a flight home wow. and like you can go because there's a hundred people that will take your spot um and she had a very famous she was like if you're early you're on time if you're on time you're late and if you're late you're bleeped wow. <laughs> and it was like oh straight up like yeah, yeah. that was how it was going to be but that's how it had to be you know like you know if you've got a team environment and everyone's meant to be buying in and everyone's trying to achieve the same goal of you know making the ncas as a team you, you can't have people turning mm-hmm. up late because, you know, well, why can't they turn up late? And it's like, well, what's the next corner we're going to cut? You know, if, if we've been set yeah, 10 yeah, yeah. miles and then we're just okay to do nine and a half. Yeah, yeah. And so she was big on the discipline. And it comes back to the wing of the plane. Like you mm. don't, you might unbolt one thing, but you yeah. don't notice it straight away because you're yeah. still going to go out and run 29.05, whatever it is that day. And yeah, yeah, I had a good performance. Great. But then it's once you've unbolted six, seven times, you started yeah. exactly cutting corners in multiple places. That's the weird thing about running. It's a slow progression up, but mm. sometimes it's a slow progression down. Down and until yeah. one day you wake up and you're like, oh, wow, no, I need to, I've changed yeah. a lot of things here. I've really laxed off a little bit, if that's even an expression. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I think, I think that's why she was so on it because she could also see that three or four, we had, well, no, we had five or six Brits on the team, all kind of in fifth or sixth year s- spots. And she had to very quickly like clamp down that mm. she was the boss and like it was her team. Yeah. That's your chance to make an impression yeah, as well. Be exactly. Like, this is who I am as a And coach. it was also very different, you know, cause I've never had a, a, a female coach before. Mm. And so it's a different relationship about the way she had to speak to us as was where Mick would speak to me. And that was interesting to learn and to, to work out how to, to approach that. So mm. no, it was good. It was good. Like she was a, a bit of a mother figure to me out there as well. You know, she definitely took the girls team were her pride and joy, you know, cause they came second at NCA cross that year, you mm. know, crazy got nationwide coverage, you know, Charlotte Taylor was killing it. She had lots of year, European doing very well as well they were kind of her like you know the mantelpiece team like you know you need to be perfect yeah, and then yeah. she was like the boys can be like 98 percent fine do you know what i mean yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, as, long, as long as i can hold them to 98 percent, like we'll be good yeah. but no she looked after us very well but caveat to that different people react to different coaches and you know there was definitely clashes and you know not everything was perfect so yeah, i was very lucky in that respect yeah, yeah. definitely that, that's that's the luck thing because you can control so much but sometimes you can't control who your coach is going to be in that environment like you were mm-hmm. just put with who you were put with so it's great that you had that that great relationship on the subject of mindset and being disciplined i think sometimes mindset is something that doesn't get discussed as much it's sort of it's talked about in the back rooms with certain coaches they talk a lot about mindset but there's others that just focus literally on the numbers and Mm -hmm. i think sometimes mindset gets overlooked and i think in researching you jack is one of the things i've come across is i think one of the reasons for your success particularly recently is it seems like you approach races quite well and possibly that's part of you finally entering your mid-20s being 25 now scientifically they talk about the fact that the cerebral cortex is finally fully formed you have a bit more of an identity from 25 onwards Uh whereas when you're like 18 
2019, you can still have like, you know, you, you must have come across it where people are quite stressed. Everything's like you identify with running a little hard. And then mm -hmm. if running goes badly, like your mood comes down almost. Whereas when you get a little bit older, um, speaking to people like Louise, myself, like I do find sometimes we're, we're more able to detach if there's a bad race, something it's all yeah. right. Like we yeah. can still smile at the end of it. It's okay. And so I just want to talk to you about, do you think that's something that's improved now? Do you feel like a bit older, you, you sort of mentally handle pressure better than you used to? Mm -hmm. And, and also just talk me through like on those start lines, do you look around and see the guys who do struggle with that more? No, definitely. The first few races I ever did, so like properly, you know, when I had a, uh, I moved to Trevor Raggett's coach uh, group in, in Woking. And the first five, six races I did, all I said for the 10, 15 minutes before was, as soon as this race is over, I'm telling my dad I'm quitting. I, I can't do this. Like, yeah. I just felt sick. And I was like, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I hate this. I hate this. And then the gun went and it all went. And like, it's amazing, isn't it? And I'd achieve what I wanted to achieve, sometimes worse, sometimes bad. I come across the line and I never had the guts to tell my dad that I right. hated it that badly. It happened for about the first 10, 12 races. Like, I can't do this. Like, I'm literally going to throw up. Like, I was like, I could be playing football with my mates tomorrow. Like, why am I doing this? Like, why this am, pressure, why yeah. am I doing a Hampshire League? The big shift, I think, really has been Tim has been huge, my coach. He's so good with the mental side of it and kind of like, he almost like two weeks out from a race is starting to like pigeonhole what he wants me to get out of the race. He's very good at like, all right, this is where you're at. And if you want to be where you want to be, you're not going to make that jump from A to Z, mm. but you know, we can deal with A to B, B to C, C to D and, and kind of tweak it and tweak it and tweak it and tweak it. So a big one last indoor season was I came second at a, a 3k invitational early in the year and I got beat I came second but you know I did all the work and if you actually watch the race I went out and had a 40 meter lead because they were all messing around running too slow at the beginning yeah, yeah. but I got caught and I didn't win the race and you know it's the next race he went into and he said you need to start learning how to win races and so the aim of this weekend is not what time you run not how you you know how you run it not even the end result like if even if you don't qualify for the europeans like it's not the end of the world i want you to win it's kind of that piecing together which i think he's been really really brilliant at and on the mental side like i quite enjoy it i, I quite enjoy the mind games before you know yeah. the, the chit chat I, the, you said something about that and i thought ah oh, that's the first time i heard that in ages because like, yeah. I, I, i'm quite similar like i just sometimes i quite like that you know i get i almost feed it's maybe it's a little dark but i almost yeah. feed, if i see someone who looks nervous i almost feed off it a little bit like yeah, yeah. you're nervous like like yeah. it's kind of almost so that's great that you've been able to flip that a little bit that no, sounds healthy i like yeah the the games you can play and you know as, as i said before the european uh, trials for 3k 12 of us sat in a squash court for two hours yeah that's that's intense you know and, and sat at each other and looked at each other and were taking the mick of out of each other and it was brilliant but then you could see you know people like me and butchart were doing really well in that environment mm. you know we're loud we like to talk you know we're asking how people are and then there's other people in the room and you can just tell like oh he's he's not in a good place yeah like you know yeah. but I, I enjoy it and like I, I enjoy going up against the other people that enjoy it you know you're on the warm up yes. you're like butch I mean you look a bit red you have breath do you know, what I mean? <laughs> you know and, and just and just like all that all that kind of stuff I quite enjoy you stand on the line and you just try to be the biggest person on the line yeah. and I think then you then you just re you're ready to go it's refreshing to hear that I, uh, all too often I think sometimes so I, I watch quite a bit of sort of I've always been into combat sports whether that be from right through from when I did karate through to boxing and then mixed martial arts and a huge part of, of fighting is mental game and in mm. the press conferences beforehand yeah. and sort of psyching each other out and the stuff. Face off, and then. sometimes I think running can be a little bit guilty of being a little bit gentlemanly and sort of yeah. like, oh, after you and we're on the oh, good, mm -hmm. good race, sir. And I, I personally quite like it when there's a little bit of back and forth and a bit of banter and, and you see a bit more of kind of uh, a London Marathon tried really hard one year when I think Mo was running up against Kip Chogin. They, they had this kind of thing where they, like, they were standing near, kind of like facing off and it was, yeah. all felt a bit kind of forced. A but bit. when you actually see a genuine kind of like guys going at each other, like in a sort of humorous way, but there's something quite nice about that. I like the sort of the aggression that can come with with fast running. No, definitely. And like, you know, I will be the first man to shake someone's hand after the race. And exactly. I think, and I think that's done, really important, that, yeah. you know, that you, you know, you give each other a little bit of chat beforehand. You race, once you're over the line. race as hard as you can. And then as soon as you come over the line, you shake someone's hand and you move on and you look forward to the next one. But no, I think the sport, this sport has to play on the rivalries that you know that's such a big part of our sport at the moment mm. is, and it's completely overlooked by you know race organizers british athletics like you look at the british championships this summer and we had like world world class 800 meter trials yeah. world class 1500 meter trials and even the 5ks you know they had you know world class people in there and there was no getting them together no getting them you know what are their thoughts you know i'd love mm. to talk to elliot giles like do you think you're going to beat jamie webb 
in two weeks time. Do you mm. know what I mean? And just, just try and ruffle some feathers and, you know, and try and have some back and forth. And it's, I, it's how you, you saw almost, it's, it's like how you, you talk sell about selling a fight. It's how you sell running is like you create exactly. narratives and you create a story within the, you know, yeah. so people understand who's in contention with each other. Exactly. And I, and I think once people buy into that, like the biggest uh, example of that is the Netflix uh, Drive to Survive with, mm. with, the, with the Formula One. I didn't watch it three or four years ago, but since watching that and you understand the politics and you understand between the yeah. drivers, what's Paints going the on, Mm. then you understand the full picture and you enjoy the full picture so much more. So I, no, I'm not saying like I'm trying to be that and trying to just wind people up left, right and, <laughs> cent left, right and center for, for like reactions. But you know, at the same time, like I don't just want to like walk up to a course, have the same conversation 15 times. Like, oh, how have you been? How's your training been? How's your coach? Like, you know, how's the part-time job? Do you know yeah. I mean, I'd rather say like, I heard you got dropped last week in training yeah. and you know, like are you confident today or, you know, is it a top mm. 10, top 20 day for you today? And you know, yeah. and, and just a little bit more like that. It's just yeah. more fun to me. I oh, know, hundred percent. I think you're right on, you completely understand. I've I always said that if I'd ever had, had got to that level, yeah. it, it's how I would be. I yeah. would definitely jibe a little bit and, and a little bit of mental warfare like I'm not going to die like I, I think there's and people forget how much strength there is mm -hmm. in, in that as well it, it's, it's within the rules to like yeah. say a couple of things here and there mm -hmm. you know without going completely over the top. as you say as long as once you cross the line there's a hug there's a handshake like yeah. you know it, it is a because it, it is a background of gentlemanly sport especially mm -hmm. in the UK like it's it's well known as that kind of white string vest kind of yeah. oh well done Arthur fantastic yeah. like that kind of stuff I'd be interested if that can, maybe that comes from my football side you know and being part of a team and, and throwing it you know within, within the match about how to wind people up and you know and stuff like that so yeah, yeah. maybe that comes from the football you mentioned Butcher um, obviously someone that you're on a start line with and a finish line with many many times and one of the interesting differences when I, I look at you guys is that uh, one of the beauties of running is that there is an idea about what's a great running physique but you mm -hmm. do get you know you look back in the days of Haile Gabriel Selassie like if you ever stood next to him in real life he's a tiny tiny guy mm. and then you've got the likes of some of the 800 meter runners certainly getting mm -hmm. very very tall you yourself for people who aren't watching this listening to the audio version are a tall runner you are mm. regularly time and time again the tallest person on the line mm -hmm. your height is it six three six, six three six four yeah, yeah yeah i just wonder how that's played in and butch for people that don't know is is a fairly shortish guy so yeah. you do stand next to it you do see the height difference and it's amazing because you've just run a few seconds apart from manchester 10k for example yeah and yet you look if you just saw you guys walking in jeans on the street you'd think well they must play different sports but it's incredible mm -hmm. that you run together um so i wonder how much your height has ever played in you've talked about the fact that you had a bit of a growth spurt and obviously that caused some hamstring issues and stuff where your body i had something similar when I was young I was really tall as a kid and then sort of mm -hmm. slowed up and then other people started overtaking me sort of held my own okay just over six foot same thing pains everywhere and all that kind of stuff first of all has it ever become a, a negative where you've kind of gone oh I think I'm getting a bit bit tall or a bit big as a runner here like a lot of these mm -hmm. guys are really small and slight have you ever worried about that or have you seen it as a positive and I've got a big leg stride I'm a mm -hmm. power runner I can get past you on that final straight how have you viewed your height I definitely think it, it goes with when you're going for a rough patch of your running. You know, when I was kind of St. Mary's and you're, you know, you're 20, 21 years old and you're like, I'm a foot taller than everyone, you know, and if I'm a foot taller than everyone, like, and I'm <laughs> four or five kilos heavy, you know, I'm 10 kilos. Weight, weight 10 starts kilos. to creep in and we know weight's a big thing in running. Yeah, weight's people, huge yeah. in running, you know, and you start questioning like, you know, am I ever going to beat these guys that are, you know, five, six and 50 kilos? Like, mm. you know, I'm 50% heavier than they are. And that definitely starts playing with your mind. And, you know, and we all know weight is such a stigma in, in sport at the moment. But my mum and dad have always been really, really good with me. They just like, you come home, you have a big bowl of food. And like, if you go out and run, you can be like whatever weight you need to be. I think when my kind of knowledge of the sport got a bit better, I think that kind of eased some of my kind of reactions to it. You know, you look at people like Craig Mottram and you see how well he did in, you know, for Australia and in that Commonwealth race uh, in S is Sydney or Melbourne when he came third or something in the 5K and, you know, he's gone sub 12 minutes and you see some of these big guys and you're like, oh, okay, like it is doable. Do you know what I mean? And then I actually like calling myself the big guy now. Do you know what I mean? So when people are like, ask like, oh, do you want to do steeplechase? And I'm like, no, no, big man, I meant for the floor. Do yeah. you know what I mean? And, yeah, you know, yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. And when people are like, oh, are you doing Liverpool cross? And I'm like, I don't know, like big men are meant for the roads. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Not when you sink in mud that's knee deep and yeah, you've got to twist and turn and stuff. But no, I like I I really like it now and I see it as a pro because, you know, I am big, I am strong. Touch wood, I, I don't have any injury problems. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I was DEXA scanned when I was like eighteen years old and 
they weren't meant to give uh, any of my results out because at 18, you, the youngest they normally do is 21. And so they pretty much told me, you are never ever gonna get a bone issue unless A, you've done something incredibly stupid. B, you literally stop eating. Mm. Uh, or C, which is never gonna be an issue of me. And C, <laughs> like something just completely freaking, you know, and you go over a route on a run and you, okay, your, yeah, your yeah, ankle yeah, just yeah. goes. Now, as a distance runner, when I know that I've got to run 90, 100, 110 miles every week, to know that in the back of my head, that like my body is actually perfectly set up for that. That must know? be great having that information exactly and so it's been a kind of a real like reassurance you know in the back of my mind all these years i, I probably should go get dexter stand again um that would probably be it's on my list to yeah do yeah, list. yeah that could be interesting to tomorrow's to-do list um compare it yeah, yeah. but no I, no it's not not something that bothers me at all these days so i think where you started to learn your strengths the height being a powerful runner jack as you settled into that really you've started to reap the rewards in the last few years but particularly 2021 has been a great year for you focusing very briefly on manchester 10k in september that was a third place for you. You had Mark Scott, 2803, Butchart ran 2805, and then yourself. I had mixed reports. I came across a 2806 and a 2807. I think there was a difference in gun time and chip time. That's probably what it because was. Because the, the front three obviously were called out and had the introductions. Yeah. And then we were all kind of like on the line back a little bit. Got you. I think it goes down to 2806. Yeah, I think the chip time is 06 and the gun time is 07. Slightly better than, yeah, 2806. Yeah. Perfect. So I just wonder, I thought that was quite an interesting uh, race to shine a light on and I think it says a lot about mindset because I was wondering, you run um, a personal best that day. It's a fantastic time. You must be delighted. Is there a part of you that loves the personal best but also at the same time knows you came third to these two guys? What, what yeah. trumps the other one? The, the personal best or do you kind of think, if I'd run a little few more seconds quicker, I might have just got butch up. Like, do you see what I'm saying? Like what, yeah. What's your mindset like in a race like that? My first thing was, yeah, I've come third and I've been beaten by two people that like my target at the moment is to beat. I wasn't be all or end all on this race because I took my break after the big half, I had a week off and we got back into it pretty quickly and everything came back pretty quickly. Tim sent me like a good program of base work, but also a few tweaking sessions that I could potentially run a fast 10K. So I kind of sat on the line and was like, I feel really good. And I know I could compete with these guys, but I don't want to be naive as hell and think I just took a week off. And if I blow up at 6K, like I don't want to like throw my toys out the pram. Do you know what I mean? And so I kind of went in with an understanding of like, this is a complete free hit and I've got no idea what's going to happen. Coming down the last K with those two was good fun because I knew I wasn't going to blow up at 6K. So I'd, I'd tick that box. But at the same time, they were just too strong. And that was slightly frustrating because I've got closer, you know, so I'm, I'm there with... 200 meters to go. And so I was like, I've ticked that box between, you know, these guys used to be way too good for me and they dropped me straight away. And then we've, we've, we've like ticked that box. I can hold on. Hanging with them now. And then we can hang with them in the middle. Yep. We've ticked that box. And then it's like, you can hang with them right to the very end and tick that box and it's like, but they've just got me again in the last 150, 200. And is that a kick thing? Is that just a final? Cause I it feel like you've got a good thing. kick, but it's yeah, just- Yeah, it was a strength thing. Like it was really tough the last 200 meters, the last 200 meters is straight uphill. And you know, I've closed in, I think I closed in 63 for the last 400, which, you know, isn't a bad 400 meters up a hill, <laughs> but you know, they're, you know, three seconds ahead and five seconds ahead. So, no, you just need, lot, yeah. yeah, you just need to go away and get better. So it was kind of, a, it was kind of like a, the time was a complete bonus. You know, if, if we ran 31, 30 and I beat Butchart and Mark, I'd be more than happy about that than the time. The time was like a massive bonus, but no, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. And Absolutely. that was, that was the cool thing about going to the great South and winning, but it was also in the back of my head. Like I want to win when those two are there. Yeah, of course. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's funny when someone looks at that, certainly from, um, and that kind of leads me perfectly into the, the next kind of topic about being at a high level and what's that, what that's like being in that position. Because I think um, certainly guilty are a lot of people, certainly who listen to this and stuff, who, you know, go out, they've run 22 minutes park runs, they're running really great times, but they just, they look sometimes at people who are winning things like the Great South Run, they wonder, what must it be like? Aren't, aren't, you must be constantly delighted with all, all your performances. And the reality is just not that. Um, I spoke to I mentioned to you earlier before we started recording this guy Callum Jones who has been on a couple of start lines with you he's a 1405 5k guy and he talked about um, attending park run I know you yourself have done Bushy Park Park Run and then I noted down there was like a Bedford Park Run in 2013 when you ran mm -hmm. a 1606 that popped up mm -hmm. in the stats and he talked about going to park run that he sort of doesn't do it very often because when he went and did this park run he was just so far off the front it just looked a bit weird like it was like mm. almost people was almost giving this kind of folded arm like well why are you here like what are you doing <laughs> almost like he doesn't 
and, and he absolutely has a right to be there and he's running you know same conditions Five same course yeah. same start line and I just wonder if you've ever come across anything like that where you do find that there are there's a, there's a limit on how many people you can run with or certain races you might not go to because you're like there's no there's no competition here there's not mm-hmm. enough to give me a flavour and, and you've just kind of exampled that by saying you know people would assume that the Great South Run must have been this absolutely and I'm sure it was an absolute delight but there's still mm. that part of Jack Rowe that goes yeah but Butchart wasn't here like you know you mm. want to beat someone who's really hardcore there do, no. do you know what I mean by that can you relate to that is there a mindset of like it, it's a little tricky to navigate those waters it is like so I've done the two last bushy ones were Christmas morning and so mm. we've made a bit of uh, kind of a, yeah, that's what we do on Christmas morning is like I get up I go around the park run we walk the dog and then we come back and we have a big breakfast and stuff but no like you know especially you, you look at like the, the park run world record and you know that I've actually that's something I've actually thought about potentially going to try and that would be great to try and get and I was actually in the race that it got set by Andy Badley at Bushy Park oh you were there in 2012 it was just before or after the Olympic Games mm-hmm. that he, he ran in and as a 1606 guy as a kid you turn up and run 16 minutes at Bushy sometimes you win sometimes you don't depending on what lot of the St Mary's guys or what pros turn up and yeah. I remember going off and this guy just flew on my inside. And I was like, well, I'm going to let him go. And then, you know, it came up at the end that he ran the 1348 Park Run World Record and stuff. Mm. And then you go into it and it's like, we have all this new shoe technology, you know, and you turn up and you race a thousand people at Bushy Park Run and you have 300 pound shoes on. And as you said, you're, you sometimes you're a minute and a half clear and they're all kind of looking at you like, oh, this is great. But like, isn't this more for the 1,000, you know, 999 people behind you? And that's definitely something I've come across, but is quite cool to go to on Christmas morning and, yeah, and race like two, there's like 2,000 people. Oh, actually, yeah, yeah. It's actually the two biggest park runs ever and I've, and I've won them. So I quite like that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that that's, must be satisfying. That's on my stat, on my stat page. So um, yeah, as you said, the Great South, awesome day out, great fun. Nice to have a really like cat and mouse race with a meal. Like it was, it was really interesting. It was horrible to be a part of because we literally started jogging at the end because none of us wanted to lead. Right. And so we literally were like walking. <laughs> I had to stop on the inside for him to come past me. And so it was horrible because I've never been in that like tactical battle before. And I've normally caved. I've mm-hmm. normally gone like, sod it, I'm just going to take it. And like he'd have sat on me and he'd have probably kicked past. Mm-hmm. But like to actually stick to my guns and get that done was very cool. But at the same time, you know, if you want to go and win these races, you know, you do want to go and beat them with with full fields. So um, Mark Scott messaged me afterwards saying like, you know, great run, you know, because he held all three of them at that point. And I was like, well, I had to take one of them off you. Yeah. And he replied like, yeah, but I wasn't there. Do you know what I mean? And so there was that little, yeah, like, little that edge. Poking again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did you feel confident going into the Great South Run? Was Did you go in brimming thinking I've got a really good chance here? Yeah, no, I did. I felt... I felt like once I'd done the half, it was going to be a lot easier. So doing the big half, I was a bit nervous going to the big half because I hadn't really trained for it. And then having done the 10K, I was like, well, I'm in really good shape. The 10 mile is going to be a lot easier than mm. the 13 mile. And it did feel a lot shorter than a half marathon. You know, it wasn't a massive field. So, you know, it wasn't like there was, you know, there was no international athletes, which, which made you obviously more confident. I knew Emil was in really good shape. I knew Dan was in really good shape. I knew Tomo was in okay shape. You, you never really know. Uh, we were trying to learn the course on YouTube a few days before. Oh, really? And every race that Tom I was in, he just blasted from the front. I was looking forward to it and I was confident. So I'd had a good little road season and I was excited to to try and win to finally win I hadn't won in a while so it was it nice. must be satisfying and it gives you that little bit of boost and kind of just makes because you can I think one of the, the problems with running is often you can spend a lot of time being around excellent people and yeah. um, there was there was a chat that you did and I think even that they made it the title comparison is a thief of joy and I think when the, the guy asked you something about any tips you'd have and you said about just just really not caring too hard about what other people are doing because everybody's different and there's just and without wishing to sort of cliche it too much like it, it is just you are who you are and you just do what you do and that's kind of and don't worry too much and then that's certainly something people seem to learn as they move through their 20s they get we get much better at like we mm-hmm. talked about maturing and just not being because when you're 17 18 you just uh, tribalism is much more of a thing and you much more are like oh sally ran this time or john ran that time you just mm-hmm. you are more in it in that way exactly I think especially once you get out of that university culture as well that big fish, yeah. fishbowl culture of like yeah. everyone's got an opinion like he mm-hmm. runs too much he runs too little he runs too fast he doesn't run at all like yeah, it's, yeah. A great, it's a great, it's a tough environment yeah. to be in. It is. All he does is bench press. Like, <laughs> you know, he can't run a 1500 meters. Like he's going to be a 10K guy. Do you know what I mean? And it's kind of all balled into one. So it's quite nice to get out of that. And it's also quite nice to get some success. You know, I'm very lucky that I've just found a process with Tim that works. And I have to appreciate that a lot of people search for a long time trying mm. to find that like puzzle that works. 
and we kind of stumbled across it quite early on that he sets me a really big Saturday and Sunday. So naturally you have to have a really easy Monday and Friday. And then we train really hard Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Do you know what I mean? And mm. like, we were like, let's just try this. And like, it weirdly just works. It's worked. And yeah. we've stuck to it. And so yeah. we are quite lucky in that respect. You have talked about seeing long time. I had a quote actually from you that said, um, give me enough time and I will beat you. And that was regarding <laughs> the, the US. And I think that's a, that's a great mindset. And it's nice that I think part of the reason for your success as well is that the mindset and stuff is that you're able to not see exactly what happened on that day on that race, but you're seeing it in the bigger picture. You're seeing the puzzle piece and how it fits into the large picture. And that's, a, mm. that's a quite an advanced mindset that I think sometimes people take as long as some people never get there. And some people it takes until their, their early 30s until they start to see and they probably look back and when they were 22 and um sort of think oh that's uh they sort of bemoan the fact that they were so focusing on e each day and each week mm. um so i think that's been that was interesting to to learn that that you were able to, to look ahead a little bit bringing it back full circle fine as we start to wrap up jack i wonder talking about you having that conversation about getting on the train about having the business suit on and that mm. kind of the way the kind of the real world lingers slightly to the to the side yeah. do you feel like you've kind of relaxed a bit more now that this is going well and you're going to be all right for a few more years and does your and, and on that subject does your family and does your dad kind of go yeah right fair enough you know things like great south run comes with a little bit of prize money so there's kind of there's an there's an economical factor there as well now that this is do you think it's something do you relax a bit more and think this is something that i feel like it's working i'm, I'm good for the moment no definitely so when i first went to st mary's it was like all right i've got three years and then i managed to get three more years in america and then I came home and I was like, all right, 2022, there's three comps, there's Commonwealths, Worlds, Europeans. And I, I literally told my dad, if I'm not in one of those teams, I'll go mind my suit. Because, you know, as an athlete, we, even when we were trying to get this, this flat, you know, they're asking you, how much do you earn? Well, I'm trying to do the most, you know, little work as possible to provide myself with a good enough income to like be able to rest and but then also to go and train and stuff and mm. yeah there's this last kind of six months it's kind of been a nice like reassurance that like all right we're on a good path we're competing with the people i need to be competing with this actually might be working you know because for a long time you actually like i was getting slowly better but i was still like a long way behind the top guys yeah. and it's like well I know, how much longer do you keep like just going into the dark not actually getting that much better so to make the jump i have in the last 18 months has been really cool because yeah there has been a little bit of like all right maybe this running actually might pay off. And like, yeah, I get some good, some good race money and I've got a really good agent that's like helping me. Uh, Malcolm Anderson from Moyo and like he's mm. been fantastic and like we're starting to build this team where like it works Tim Eglin my coach is amazing my agent is amazing we're going to hopefully sign something soon and like that will be another source of income that I can rely upon I was for a long time like dad was like how much how much longer are you going to do this for do you yeah. know what I mean and like you're just yeah. tacking on another couple of years yeah. just give me another couple uh, of years I'll be alright and that's the problem is then but then you throw in the towel and you're like oh what if do you know oh, what yeah. mean? and, and, that, no, no, and you that always are, plays you've made the right decision trust me there are, I'm sure there are people right now who are 47 yeah. and, and quit something when they were 23 and they, they definitely, that what if lingers. Yeah. So no, it's good. It's good. It's been a nice kind of reassurance the last few months to be like, all right, we're making progress. Mm. We're paying for ourselves and you know, maybe we can actually make some money out of this. Running, absolutely running malarkey yeah yeah and it, it has its own motivational factor sort of running away from the shadow of having to do something a bit more real worldy yeah I've had a similar experience with doing the podcast the YouTube channel for Jog On and, and you just made the comment about just trying to work just enough that you can yeah. kind of and it's the same similar for me I just do a couple of days a week so mm -hmm. I can do this as well yeah. and it's about trying to make this full and, 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 and survive and I myself have looked at rentals recently and you do come up against a very old mindset uh, old school culture of like well are you working full time at the moment and it's like yeah. well, it's quite complicated to explain how I earn money. It's all it's, a, it's sort of all these little things. It's like weird. And you have Am you Amazon Prime, you're doing yeah. twice a week. And the Amazon Prime thing, was yeah. does it ever concern you that you're fatiguing a little bit because you're jumping out delivering parcels? It's just a random side question I had. No, definitely. Like towards the beginning, I was knackered. And it's also like the weird kind of single movements that you do, like getting in and out of a van. Like yes. the first like three months, my back was like just, it just didn't move. It's like a lot because of repetition, like, yeah. Because you get in and you do the exact same movement like, 150 times a day like yeah. when would you ever get in and out of your car 100 which is an athlete trying to conserve energy yeah. that's slightly there's a bit of a contrast there. exactly but i actually think there's also conversely there's a weird s and c okay, yeah, <laughs> aspect yeah. of it where like you know if i'm carrying a mini fridge up to like floor 12 yeah, and, yeah, like, yeah. and like the lifts down like, yeah, yeah that's my gym done for the day yeah um so i do think there's a weird kind of prehab like actually just got quite strong out of it because yeah you do walk about fifteen thousand steps a day yeah. carrying anything from letters to yeah 
Yeah, you must have quite a lot of steps per week, that included with the running. Yeah, the steps is good. I hit my goals, so <laughs> my Garmin loves me. <laughs> Amazing. Jack, it's been brilliant to talk to you. I think really my final question is just looking forward to the future without sort of uh, cliching it too much about, oh, what are your future goals, Jack? As I understand it, the big the big focus is the half marathon. Yeah. Um, would it be for, for marathon? Obviously, London is always calling. Do you think it will be a, a slow approach to London marathon? I, there must be a part of you that just looks yeah. at people running and think, I can do that. I can go to London marathon. I can do it now but you also want to hold back a bit yeah no the, this last kind of two to three months has been really eye-opening um i've always had this weird confidence on the roads uh, i've always competed really well beating people especially as a kid that i couldn't be on the track or the cross country so it's been fun to go there for a while i'll definitely step back to the track up until kind of mid-june like i think it'll be a real a real good goal to make the world team in Eugene. Like that's that's kind of my A standard goal for like the next nine months is, okay. you know, run the world time, come top two at the trial. And then, yeah, and then we're going to hit September, October, November next year. And there's going to be that whole big half London, the great run series, kind of that whole stretch again and, and how involved they get again would be cool. You know, there's a massive financial aspect to it. That, yes. you know, I'll probably, exposure is a big thing. Exposure will be a big thing. Um, whether I could potentially pace London, whether I give it a go, maybe I pace and then carry on. I don't, I don't know. Um, it would be good fun either way, but it's just nice to know that it is, it's kind of there. You know, mm. I've always thought like, oh, I might be quite good on the roads, you know, having, cause I haven't done any for like four or five years, mm. but to come have some success, run well, feel smooth doing it. Um, it's been the, okay, I've got something like sat in my back pocket that in the future could be good. Because, you know, the track's hard, you know. It's very the, the hard. You describe is, it as a fishbowl, and it, and it is yeah. a bit of that. It's like there's a lot of folk. And if you're dying, you're dying yeah. for a few laps in front of everyone. And it's Exactly. And there's no there's no escaping it. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, on, on the road, you know, you go through good patches, you go through bad patches. But, you know, it's just like, you know, get to that corner and then, then see how you feel. Yeah. And like, oh, it's a downhill. Perfect. We've got 200 meter downhill. Let's mm -hmm. just chill out and, like, get our breath back. Whereas, like, you don't get that on the track. You know, yeah, it's absolutely. bend, straight, bend, straight. Yeah. And straight. It's so, pretty no, ruthless the track. It is, it is. But no, it's exciting. It's exciting. So I think yeah, the next twelve months are gonna be a be quite good fun. No, perfect. I look forward to uh, watching some of it. And I think it'll be very nice if you take the approach like you have done for your whole career and it's been so successful. You is this kind of slower approach of easing into things bit by bit. Let's just do a piece at a time, like you say, A to B, B to C, and mm -hmm. keep doing that as you move up the distance. Because it is a big jump from half to marathon. Like people just go, half, yeah, marathon. But you're yeah. like, no, that, that's massive. Like that's yeah. a lot. That's a long way. So it might be about approaching it correctly um, with Tim. Um, Jack, it's been absolutely superb talking to you. I really appreciate you coming on to the podcast to talk to me. I look forward to tracking your career and following it. And I'll be around the different places where you train so have been in the past so it'll be great to to see you at places maybe even one day i'll, I'll join you for a sunday run in swinley forest uh if i can be more get, than welcome more get than my pacing <laughs> pacing quick enough um i want to uh leave you with a quote that you said i think in one of the san francisco university videos which i just thought was quite nice uh to finish with which i think sums up your mindset quite well in regards to uh this kind of seeing the long game and approaching it right and having a healthy mindset and knowing how to deal with with pressure in the right way you said if you're not prepared to do everything then you're not going to get what you want out of anything which I think sums it up really really nicely Jack thank you very much for speaking to me it's been great no very welcome I had a lot of fun uh, we could have talked for hours um, we, could. We, could, we could have done that two or three times over so no thank you very much and uh, yeah it'll be great to catch up in the future awesome Jack thank you Jog On produces podcast episodes and videos about the world of running and adventure to find out more or to purchase Jog On merchandise check us out at thisisjogon.com I'm Harry Morgan. Keep your mind and legs strong. And this is Jog On. Yeah.